Hey, howdy, hello, and welcome to the show. Welcome back to another episode of the Steam Red Light series, the series where we look at Steam's most lowly and controversially rated games to see if they're as bad as the internet says they are. I'm your host for the day, Smirk. Today's game is called The Uncertain, Light at the End. This game is normally priced as a $15 game and was released on October 8th of 2020. It was developed by New Game Order while being published by Meta Publishing. As of Saturday, October 10th, the game has 90 reviews in total, with 60% of them being positive. The Uncertain Light at the End is a third-person adventure where you play as a girl named Emily, one of the survivors in a post-apocalyptic world where robots actively want to eradicate all humans. Emily stays with a small group of other survivors that mostly fulfill all the iconic tropes of survivor diversity. The gameplay elements this game features is puzzle-solving, decision-making, quick-time events, with some light appearances of stealth walking. In the short amount of time I've played this game, I was able to finish it, so you could probably expect a playtime similar to what you see in this review here of 4 hours. The story is primarily driven about the group's changing needs to survive in a world where they're no longer welcome after an event that's only referred to as the incident occurred when the robots began their uprising. Emily's role in the group is that she's one of the few who can go out and retrieve materials. During your time at the hideout or abroad, you'll have opportunities to learn about the characters you're sharing space and time with, or about the world itself through audio recordings, newspaper articles, or other abandoned artifacts. Now, because this game is largely story-driven, some people may interpret some of my sampled scenarios as potential spoilers, even though I keep them as ambiguous as possible. If you care about preserving your knowledge about the game to an absolute minimum, just skip to my summary and rating of the game using the timestamp displayed on the screen now. And I'll give you a few more seconds. Alright, we've covered everything I think we needed to for the foundation, so let's just move on to what I liked about the game. My favorite part about this game was the puzzle diversity. The store page mentions this as a game feature, and I think they fulfilled that promise. There's about a dozen or so puzzles in the game in total. Some of the puzzles are much easier than the others. For example, I'd probably say the safe puzzle was probably one of the harder ones and took me about four minutes to solve, and was perhaps a poor choice to put as the first puzzle in the game, whereas the water pressure puzzle was significantly easier and took me about 30 seconds to finish. Nonetheless, there were some interesting puzzles I hadn't seen in any game before, and I enjoyed the challenge they presented. Oh god, I hope the person who owns this safe doesn't store weapons in here. There's no way they'd solve this puzzle under pressure. However, it's worth noting that there was one puzzle where I just pressed Q and the puzzle was solved without actually attempting it. I don't know if I randomly just got a winning arrangement. I wasn't even sure what the prompt was. I just accidentally pressed Q and that it was done. Oh, all in a day's work, I, I guess. Another thing I enjoyed about the game was actually the voice acting. However, I'm going to put a big-ass asterisk right here because we're going to revisit this later in the next section. For a $15 indie developed game, the English voice acting was well above what I would have expected. I'd even say that everyone, save for Matt's delivery, is well executed for almost the entire time. Now, is the voice acting better than William Defoe Beyond Two Souls? No, but it's definitely better than the voice acting in House of the Dead 2, and I'm convinced that that game had a bigger budget than this one. To protect the life cycle, I have made a creature to rule over mankind. Lastly, the graphics are pretty good all around, the visual design of the world is nice, and the facial animations aren't exactly stellar, but the lip syncing is definitely doing its best when it comes through. Who'd have thought we'd need money again? Oh, Emily, I had no idea you practiced ventriloquy in your spare time. Oh my god, Emily, why do you have your hands sprawled out like that? Do you, do you have a do you have a cramp? ...out in the open, it's time to move on to what I did not like about the game. One of the small things that bothered me during my time in the game is that there's a small plot inconsistencies that kind of pop up. For example, there's a part of the game where Matt cuts his hand and says his arm is useless. With you? Damn it! Sliced my hand. But then he proceeds to open up a huge sewer door not long after. Now, if you think he got better, he later reminds you that his hand is still hurt and he can't open a subway train door. Matt and I can handle this. Uh, have you looked at my arm lately? Another example is that when Brian fixes and returns Emily's smartwatch to her, he mentions that the navigation systems have been turned off in order to prevent the robots from tracking her. It took some tinkering, but I was able to disable the antenna and navigation modules, so no one can track you. However, later on in the game, Emily mentions using the map on her smartwatch to navigate through the city. I've got a better idea. The map shows a manhole nearby. We can go under through the sewers. While these aren't that prevalent, it does kind of shatter immersion, which is kind of one of the biggest things a game needs to uphold when a game is primarily driven by its story. Another thing that bothered me is certain aspects of gameplay. For example, when you're doing a stealth walk segment, it's very clear to tell when you should make a run for the next piece of cover. However, the validity of what the robots can see is immediately drawn into question when they don't see Emily, or in this specific chapter, Brian, when either Emily clips through the robot in question, or how Brian just hangs back several feet away from cover. Hey Brian, uh, you wanna... you wanna bring it in, buddy? I don't know if you think you have nothing left to live for, but there are better ways to go out than this. 
Also, at some point there's a scene where this robot is killed by some loose electrical cables that happen to be touching a puddle of water. Now, we're going to look past the fact that this is the kind of life form that's currently superseding humans in this universe and just take it as is. I went over to the puddle just to see if Emily got shocked or if she tried to prevent us from going in in any way, and to my surprise, she walked in and died a horrible and gruesome death. Sorry, that wasn't entirely true. In actuality, nothing happened. So either Emily put on her rubber-soled boots that day, or the developers overlooked this during development. In the same chapter, Emily also says to herself that she should try to avoid being detected by the service bots, but when I try on purpose to get caught by them, she waves it off by saying they must be too busy servicing to notice me, which just seems lazily dismissive. Do all the robots in this universe just lack perception? The ability to hear? Why does this cop not hear Park shout near him when they're less than six feet away? This is our chance! Go! Go! The non-puzzle gameplay is just plagued with small, questionable encounters that further make parts of this game unbelievable. Cops! Damn! And they're coming our way! Okay, everyone just walked in front of that cop and, and he did not see any of them. I'm convinced that robots can't possibly be our superiors and this whole incident is just some large misunderstanding. Lastly, my biggest problem is ultimately the overall sound design. Now, remember when I put that big-ass asterisk back in the last section? Well, now's the time to tell you what it was for. Some parts of this game's sound design are incredibly lacking. While the voice acting is delivered adequately most of the time, the rest of the time these weird audio equalizations show up. Too risky. There's no way to tell what would happen. Sometimes, the characters sound like they're speaking from a vent. Oh, you're back. So, how did it go? Sometimes, the characters' voice lines speed up for no reason. Yeah, right. Nothing at all suspicious about a helpful robot. Whoa, Matt. Uh, I know you look like the stereotypical Eminem fan, but that doesn't mean we need you to recite Rap God for us whenever you feel like it. And then in other cases, voice lines just fail to get delivered at all. If it wasn't for the subtitles, I wouldn't even have known that anybody meant to say anything. Anybody else who plays along may notice that this becomes heavily prevalent when you're going through the sewers. It almost seems like bug fixing stopped right before they got to this chapter because missed sound cues happened so many times. Maybe the too quiet graffiti is in reference to Emily not being able to say her voice lines half the time down here. And that's just the problems related to the voice lines. There's a couple of instances where something is done and there's no sound effect to accompany what happened. For example, there's no elevator sound effects. Oh man, I'd hate to get stuck in here. It's not too far-fetched to say that it's a completely silent elevator, but there's also a time where Matt puts this box down and there's just nothing to accompany it. If I didn't have a problem with how sound was implemented in this game, I could have chosen to ignore this, but since we're talking about it, here we are. Now the last thing I have to say about the sound design is that the game promised in its features mood-setting music. Yet, during a tense situation during the television station chapter, I heard nothing moody about the music. It was the same song that had been playing the entire level. Most chapters only have one looping song in the background, and some songs make reappearances in other levels. The music itself isn't really that big of a deal on its own, it's mostly insignificant and forgettable, but when you stack it up with the rest of the sound problems in this game, it ends up just being another mismatched voice in the cacophony of sound-related problems in this game. I'm not even going to talk about what I thought about the ending sequence or the fact that you can't skip any dialogue, even the ones that go on for a good amount of time, but both topics belong in this section also. I could probably go on for a lot longer in this section, but I think we've covered enough to pass a verdict. The puzzle designs are excellent. The voice acting is well delivered, most of the time. The art design is well executed. There are a small handful of plot inconsistencies, questionable and shallow gameplay experiences, dozens of examples of poor sound implementation. Ultimately, I must say that I do not recommend the uncertain light at the end. I believe the game could turn around positively with a thick layer of polishing, hopefully starting with the sound design. I really do think that the sound design weighs this game down the most and just provided such a terrible endgame experience that it was impossible for me to ignore that lack of quality assurance. I could see myself potentially re-reviewing based on what the patch notes bring, as the developers have been very active on the store page. I also learned after I completed the game that this game was a continuation of another story called The Uncertain, Last Quiet Day, that was released four years ago. But I really feel like this game, the store page, and the developer made no indication of that. I think it's really unfortunate because Last Quiet Day has some very positive reviews, but this sophomore release fell on harder times. And that's the end of the video. Here are some things you can do to show support to the channel if it was worthy of your time. Please like the video if you liked the video, I guess. 
share the video with someone who you think may like it, comment on what you thought about the video, the game, or the review, and lastly, subscribe if you couldn't shirk the smirk and maybe I'll see you next week. Stop it, Alex. You should be ashamed.